Our next speaker is Kurt Grutzmacher. He's a solutions architect for the Manage the Threat Defense Group of Cisco Systems. He's been a penetration tester for over 13 years, spanning financial, utility, and consulting groups. Some of these organizations he's broken into include multinational corporations, network service providers, government agencies, and the corner mom and pop shop. He's been playing with Bro for around five years with more aggressive work in the past six to eight months. Welcome, Kurt. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, a, a tool or a, an environment, basically, we're building as part of the Management Defense that feeds a lot of uh, sources of telemetry. Bro is one of them. That's why I wanted to come here and talk about it, because obviously we, we have these issues. So it's called OpenSOC, and we call it OpenSOC because it is going to be open source. It's not yet, because Cisco marketing and the mess of that, but what, what are we trying to address with OpenSOC? Well, as a security operations center, you have a lot of challenges. Those challenges just get worse every day because your volume, you know, it was terabytes, now it's zettabytes, it's huge. We're just gathering all this information. So how do we store it? Well, how do we maintain it? How do we manage it? How do you review it? How do you do what you want to do with it? And your, your data is variety, so you have a lot of structured and unstructured data coming in. Uh, Bro is very well structured. I like that out of it. You know, everything you can send me in a JSON field as everything's segmented out. I can I can do it. I can do what I need to do with it without having to write regexes, which slowed down processing a lot. And of course, everything's a sensor. Everything generates logs now. What do you keep? What do you know? What do you monitor? All those good things. And data quality. How good is that data? Uh, and then, what do you keep? What do you purge? How long can you keep it? Um, do you summarize? What happens when you summarize? What do you lose? So these are things that as a SOC, especially at Cisco, where we're seeing you know, a multinational company with lots and lots of traffic and lots and lots of data being generated, we lose things when we summarize that are important when we have to do analysis a month later or two months down the road. So OpenSOC, our model here is that it's data-driven security. Just gather data, gather data and keep it. So it's a unified platform for ingest, storage, and analytics, multiple views, uh, interactive analysis, predictive modeling. Um, those are probably the two th key things, the analyst and, and modeling, analytics and modeling, uh, and contextual real-time alerts. Um, when an incident happens, when, an, when a, uh, an investigator starts looking at things, what are the first thing they do? They look at it, you know, source IP, destination IP, what was it, what happened, now I'll say, all right, what is the context around that alert? Well, with OpenSOC, with our process here, we want to give them that uh, context as it is. And Bro does that to some extent already with your Intel feed. So you, you go to, to your uh, threat intelligence that says, here's something that came from Romania. I never talked to Romania, so why am I seeing that? Well, here's an IP address. It's only as good as the geolocation database, but still. It's, it's contextual information because it gives you some real view of what's happening. And rapid deployment and scoring. You know, once OpenSOC is up and running, which is, for us, it's a huge rack of equipment, um, it's always ingesting, always doing something. If your telemetry goes down, it doesn't really hurt everything else that happens. If, if like, if Bro sensor dies, you go and you fix it. If your source fire sensor dies, you go and you fix it. If your syslog disappears, you know, but it doesn't stop the processing of what's happening, of other things. So, if you go to conferences a lot, you hear the big data. We've heard that for like five, six years now. Big data, big data, big data. Well, it's important because we can only hold so much data in for you boxes. In, you, know, you can hold a lot, but if you're ingesting a ton of traffic at a time, which is kind of things that we're doing, you can't do it in for you. So you've got to scale it out. You've got to scale it out. You know, Huge, huge places. Parallel and scalable computational tools. Again, Bro is great. You put it on a box and you eat up your CPUs. It's doing cool things, but is it doing really what it needs to be doing for what it should be doing? If that makes sense. I didn't think that ahead, but. Cheap, massively scalable storage. Again, um, you can, when you build a Hadoop cluster, you basically are, you can use anything off the shelf. You put it together, you, you put a whole bunch of drives into a system, and then you just scale that out. 
you just add more and more and more. Uh, and, and that's just what you do. Stream computation, stream analysis. As, as alerts come in, as the telemetry comes in, what do you do with it? How do you enrich it? That's what we'll talk about here. And scaling and approximation. So what are the technologies we're using for OpenSock? Well, Apache Flume is a big capture layer. So a Flume will receive events from multiple sources, be it syslog, be it files, be it whatever, and turn it into Kafka things. So data bus, or, or Kafka is where all that data comes in and it gets processed. So if you really have not followed Hadoop so much, um, this is where, you know, Kafka is a large, quickly streaming message queuing system. Um, and it's very, very fast, very, very effective. Um, Apache Storm is actually a steam processor. He is the one that says, I pull that message off the Kafka topic, and I do something with it, I add on my, my stuff, which we'll talk about the stuff here in a second, uh, and then put it back on the data bus for more processing, more things. What's it gonna do after that? Now, once all that is done, what do you do with the, that information? Well, you throw it into Elasticsearch because Elasticsearch is pretty awesome. Um, or you throw it into a long-term storage like Hive. There's also a long-term, we call it long-term packet store, but HBase, which is basically a SQL database for, for structured data. And you basically put files out there um, and it becomes this huge SQL-like language that you can query against. And then visualization, Kibana. Kibana is awesome. If you have not seen Kibana, just start using. Put Elasticsearch, I mean, you, you look Logstash, Kibana, uh, and Elasticsearch together, and it's an awesome tool, but it doesn't scale very well because all that data is right in there, but, and, and Logstash does some pretty cool things, but again, we're talking about one gigabyte, 10 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes a second. Those tools will not scale. So as I said, big data over here. Put all these things together in a big mesh. We got Hadoop, we got Kafka, Storm Elasticsearch, all those together. We have a scalable compute, Multi-petabyte multi storage. Honestly, we have, we go to customers of managed threat defense, we put in a rack. About 80% of that rack is filled with UCS Cisco gear that's filled with hard drives that is gathering data and doing our analytics as part of it. Interactive queries, real-time search, unstructured data, scalable stream processing, but I have to mention this already, haven't I? Put those together. Now you have real-time alerts on all this data coming in at you at 10, 20, 50, 100 gigabytes, 100 gigabits a second. Anomaly detection, data correlation, rules and reports, predictive modeling, UI and applications. This is all available to you as OpenSock, free, available. Now, that means the plumbing is available to you free. You still gotta build it. You still gotta put together your 50 to 60 machines. You still gotta manage your Hadoop environment. So it's not entirely a you know, install it and forget it type of solution. It's a lot of work. We have a lot of engineers that keep this running. So in a quick nutshell, over the left here we have our telemetry sources. So your raw network stream. We actually do pull off the traffic and store it in Hadoop. Why do we do that? Well, we want to have our analysts available to go back in time and say, here is something that happened. Now here's a PCAP of what occurred. And if you have a month worth of that data with you know, that huge rack of equipment, you can actually go and start doing analytics against other things that might have happened. It's a slow process, so you don't do it all the time. But you have that capability to say, here's an error traffic. Put it aside. Put it where something that is important that can be longer term. The network metadata stream. Um, That's where we take things like bro, and we extract out all the important parts, the relevant, the file information, the, um, the, the protocol data, anything that's important that can stay for a long time because your packet network stream can last maybe a month at these speeds, depends on how much storage you have. Your network metadata, that can last a long, long time. It's a small amount of information that's very important for investigations and very important for analytics, but also it just it can stay around, which is great. So we also pull in NetFlow. I mean, we're Cisco, we gotta do NetFlow. Syslog, of course, 
any raw application logs, your Apache logs, your you know, anything else log that you see that you want to collect, and other streaming telemetry. All those feed in to our process here where we parse it and format it, put it on our big processing here that enriches it. So we now take our thread intel feeds, which you can have your public and your privates. You got to put those onto the Hadoop cluster. You can't use APIs. Well, you can, um, but you're going to beat the crap out of them because you're pulling in 10 gigs a second. You're going to be looking at thread intel feeds on all those things. And so you have to really bring that thread intel closer to you. Uh, and also enrichment. Well, I'll talk more detail about those in a second. After that, after all that intel has occurred, the, the processing occurs, it gets dropped off to log mining and analytics, PCAP, PCAP reconstruction and packet mining, throw that into HBase, big data exploration, predictive modeling, throw that into Hive. And so now we have the plumbing, the information that people that really care about data scientists, that care about the modeling, care about, you know, you heard yesterday, you know, I think Bob said, you know, network modeling or, or threat modeling on network traffic is probably not going to happen because no one has, is sharing their models. That's true, but big data analytics is happening in most large Fortune 50 companies right now on the network side. Uh, it is happening. We're not sharing as much, yes, because everyone's holding it together, but they're doing these things right now, and we're doing it too. Let's make sure I got my notes here. So there are actually four areas that OpenSock covers. So we have a mechanism to capture, store, and normalize any type of security telemetry at high rates. We have real-time processing and application enrichments, efficient information storage, and an interface that gives security investigators a centralized view of data and alerts passed through the system. All right, that's marketing, but it's good. What drives the choice of HBase for your packet store? What drives HBase? What, yeah, why did you choose HBase? Um, it was many discussions, so the question was why did we choose HBase? Um, when we started this about a year ago, uh, we were looking at all the different Hadoop potentials available, and HBase was probably the most stable at the time. Uh, we looked for a lot of stability. So, like, we used Storm. We could have used Spark. By the time we started this, Spark was still not quite um, reliable, and we, not, we needed reliability. Now, the truth is Hadoop even when they say it's reliable, it's release code, production code, or whatever, it's not. It still crashes all the time. But that's part of Hadoop. You always are getting <laughs> better. OK, so let's look at our pipeline in a bit more detail. So we talk about the pipeline here. We can take any sort of this data here. So you can say this is source fire alert data, this is bro messages, these are syslog data, these are packets coming in. It's all the same in essence. When, the, when the, 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 the traffic comes in and gets put onto this Kafka queue for processing, at that point it's this raw message. It's, it's a JSON formatted string from bro, it's a syslog message, it's whatever. We now then have to transform it, enrich it, at which point we then go through a number of aggregation methods and machine learning. So now we've, we've converted it to something we can process. We've added some telemetry data to it. And now we're going to aggregate it together, throw that data out into HBase. We're going to do some machine learning, run our models against it, do our scoring, and throw that into Hive. And then anything that is important, we're going to throw out an alert. Alert then goes out, you guys can see it's kind of low, but um, it's going to throw out to a UI through Elasticsearch, basically. Uh, and then our analysts can then say, hey, our models here, our streaming methods here, there's something that you need to look at that's important. Because right now, a security operations center basically runs playbooks. And the playbook says, every four hours, run this query on your seam, and then do something with it. Well, that's OK, but that's that four hour window, or that two hour window, or that 16 hour window, and that something has happened which you're not really doing. But again, that's because, they do those because, Otherwise, you just get screened with alerts that are really not that important every time. Is the orange or red or whatever the color that is, the alert the box on the top right, uh, is that kind of a filtering mechanism that 
Oh, so I was wondering about the top right box that says alert. Is that a filtering mechanism that is applied to the data as it arrives to allow sort of immediate uh, re reaction when the data is already coming in before it's getting through the entire big pipeline? Yes, so the alert part that happens during the OpenSock streaming session is something that is rule-based. So you have a rule that says, if I see traffic from these countries or whatever, alert. Uh, or if, if something matches, so it's like kind of a regex connection. So, but can you use the same sort of query language to connect this real-time triggers to the historic forensic process that you're using? So the, you're talking about the machine learning process? Um, machine learning maybe, that sounds more like an automated process, more algorithms that have been right. created in advance, but more so the interactive incident response sort of queries that you put at the system. Are they in the same format as this alert system? So is the, is essentially the question is, is the historic interface to go in the past and look okay. for stuff the same as if you would you know, create f triggers for the future? Um, right now it is the, the, the alerts, I, I guess you're kind of asking, you know, can you modify the alerts as they're being processed? Like can, can the analysts go and say, hey, I need a new alert to do things? Yeah, here's a concrete use case. You okay. go to, back in the past, figure out a set of queries that give you the bad data and say, okay. hey, whenever this happens again, I want to be alerted immediately. And so essentially, you only flip a switch and say, okay, whenever I see this activity that I've described with my query, I would like to get a notification. Yeah, that, that is the goal, that you can, um, what you've learned, you can then reapply for alerts, flip the switch that says, now when you see this again, or something like this. So this rule, this, these rules for the alert are really you know, operations-based. They're, they're not learned from the tool, in essence. They're what you put in already. Question? Another question, yes. Way in the back. So actually, this is the, this may be a very elementary question, but uh, uh, your machine learning algorithms and when you go back to the historical data to search and figure out that this is relevant information of an attack or something uh, problematic and you generate a new alert out of it, general experience has been that the old data is more used to weed false positives out rather than come up with a new detection technique. So is that something you have an opinion or comment on? So, yeah, it, that's a very good question because um, the old data is important to validate your rules, validate your, your machine learning, in essence. Um, the hope is that uh, the, the weeding out of false positives happens because that, that's a more manual um, brain looking at it. You know, machine learning is only as good as the models that are built. The alerts are only as good as we write them. Uh, and, and so, yeah, you're going to get false positives. You're going to have things that um, might lead you down rabbit holes. But the, the hope is that with these tools, you can make the right decisions so that you don't go down those rabbit holes. So just a follow-up question. So uh, what kind of like an attack you can find going back into the historical data which you haven't seen before yet with a machine learning algorithm? Well, uh, the, well with machine, so I'll, I'll say honestly, I'm the plumber here. I'm not the machine language architect. Um, so I can't answer that side of the question, but I can say when, let's say Heartbleed happens, and now you can go back into your logs histories and your packet history and start seeing what are the, you know, what are the, the other symptoms that have been seen. You know, can you take our PCAP data from the last month and rerun the bro script that was modified to say, all right, here's detecting that. Now, it might take 12 hours, 13 hours for, you know, to do as a MapReduce job because you're not going to give it as much resources as you're streaming, but it's potentially available to you to do. Thank you. Yeah, I had two questions. Oh, sorry. I had two questions. Um, one is, are you doing your, your parsing in Flume, or are you doing that in uh, Storm? The parsing, parsing, parsing logs out to like a taxonomy or something? Well, depends on, on what the, the telemetry source is. In some cases, you want to do it in Flume. It's, it's, okay. But you also want to do it, it, if you can do it in Storm, it's better, 
okay. because Storm is, has you know, all these CPUs available to it to do its job, where Flume might only have one box or two boxes to do it. And so the whole point of streaming telemetry is get it in as fast as possible so that your compute environment can deal with it. Okay. Um, as far as bits per second, how much have you guys seen that you've been able to push into this? So I was expecting that question. Uh, <laughs> we have, uh, in, in our lab environment, we've been pushing about 1.5 gigs a second, um, gigabits per second, uh, and capture. Now, the thing is, when you, when you talk about clustering, um, we have a limited number. So for our customers, we can only go in with a rack. And that's probably about 15 to 16, you know, 32 CPUs, you know, nice CPU, UCS boxes. Um, but the theoretical limit is how many more of those do you want to put out there? Because the, 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 the headaches we have of our limitation is only because of our self-imposed and customer-imposed limitation. The reality is you can stream more by just adding more in that cluster. You need to scale up. Okay, so here's an example of what we're doing with streaming. So we have a, this is a syslog example. Um, the message comes in, gets processed, gets turned into, you know, right now it's not, it's being split apart since we know, you know, source IP, source port, dest IP, and we do some geo enrichment on that. So we add all the local geo, um, all the geo stuff we can, and we also do who is enrichment. For every single message that comes in, every single IP address, we're looking that up. Because we found when analysts get an alert, the first thing they do is, well, who was it? Second thing they do is, where were they? And third thing they do is, what were they doing? So now we have this information. We've, we've added it to on top of this message. Very simple. Oh, another question. How are you dealing with the uh, trustworthiness of the feeds? And the correlation of the feeds. As an example, I've seen feeds from other places mm -hmm. where the feeds were actually compromised right. and either provided false information or information that was distracting to the analysts. Uh, are you dealing with that as part of the um, process? Well, that would be a operational process of how you get those feeds. Where do you trust? Because, again, we're pulling them in and placing them onto our cluster for uh, streaming parts. Where that data came from, you know, let, let's say that um, um, your, your threat intel source was compromised. You're not going to know it until it comes out. So how can you make any decisions based on that beforehand? There's methods. Well, okay. yeah, there could be. So when you, when you think about Storm, Storm creates this topology. Basically, you, you, you put a stream of data in, and so it make these tuples, and then it does a bunch of things to that. So everything goes through. So a message comes in as a stream, and it gets parsed on a bunch of different things. It gets enriched, it gets put in another enrichment on who is, goes back on the Kafka for saying, all right, do your next thing with it. So that's part of this whole streaming part. So again, with aggregation, we're, we're taking the data that came off of the streaming and aggregating it together. We're, we're saying, all right, what are, throughout this time, you know, how many messages have you seen, what top protocol, or counts of protocols, counts of cities, you know, counts from IP, sketch A, to whatever. We're aggregating all that together. Yes? How do you validate the sensor integrity as part of this? That's an operation question. Good question. Um, it's not been a, um, not it one that we've asked issue. yet. It's a big issue. It is a big issue. Well, okay. I, I, I agree it is a big issue. Um, but it's not one that we're answering right now, or we're looking to answer. Um, it's not one that we really, we're, we're still in the build, build stage, okay. in essence. Okay, so after the aggregation happens, well, this is the aggregation topology, is it the same thing happening, happening where, the, where the, the data comes in, um, data comes in, goes through its, all its filtering process, 
does some all amazing things on the data science side, puts all back out in the HBase. At what, which point we can also do the machine learning parts. This is the part that honestly I am not the person to ask. Um, I can give you the contact of the people who are the people to ask um, if you really aren't interested in what they're doing. Um, but th honestly, this is what we're, we're going towards is, is to build these systems that we can do this machine learning, we can do this type of activity, these types of functions on lots and lots of data and not just PCAT data, not just syslog, not just all that, all that together. <laughs> Third question. <laughs> Will the machine language uh, code actually be released with part of this, or will that be part of Cisco's proprietary side? Good question. Uh, the answer is um, we'll have to ask the lawyers. I don't know. Um, I think they want to do some. I, I know that the, the, the guys are doing the machine learning parts. They want to release it, but we'll see what happens. Like, Cisco is a big behemoth company, and it takes time for these things. You know, we wanted to have OpenSock ready before this presentation. We're getting hung up with some other things internally. So, it, but it will happen soon. Uh, whether or not everything will be, we'll see. Yes. Yes, so the streaming, the enrichments, the um, uh, aggregation, all that is, will be open sourced. And so if you like to code in Java, you have fun, because that's what Storm is. Well, you can do it in Python. You can do, you actually, you can, uh, Storm allows you to write in other languages, but it still runs on this whole Java environment. And we do recommend, you know, not that we recommend using Java, I don't recommend using Java, but um, <laughs> it is there. And it is something that you can, you, you can fork, all the repository will be on GitHub. Um, you can already star the, um, the uh, uh, some of the pages. But it, it's something you can, you know, fork itself. You can modify it. You can submit PRs. All that is the idea. We're, we're not holding on to this, except for the machine learning stuff. But we're not really holding on to OpenSock. We're bringing it out because we believe that, you know, these tools, these systems, have to be better. And we don't want to, to say, come buy this product, because the product's not going to solve it. We human beings are going to solve it. OK, so for the machine learning parts, um, where are we at? We're 20, oh, i got to hurry up. Uh, machine learning, that's all cool stuff. It's basically the same kind of thing. Event comes in, it does its all magic of online, offline models, and then However, based on the score, it goes to alert or it goes to its output. So the thing that I really cared about uh, in this environment um, was, the, was the, the metadata. Because the PCAP and the, and the DPI technology topology together really gave me the idea of what this is. Coming from an attacker, coming from an analyst background. Oh, these didn't show up. They were too funny. All right, so we've got our, you've seen this kind of before, but our Kafka spout comes in. So the bro emits a message, and it goes into Kafka, and, and Kafka just streams this data. We don't really parse it because it's already JSON, so we kind of parse it a bit. We do our enrichment and throw our stuff into HDFS, throw it to Elasticsearch, throw it into HBase. All this stuff happens, you know, pretty darn fast. That's the idea of Hadoop. Do this thing fast, get it out, go to the next packet. And so we do capture the entire PCAT traffic and put it into HBase. Yes, another question. How do you decide what goes into Hive and how do you decide what kind of information goes into Elasticsearch and so on? Okay, so the decision factors for this based, is based on the telemetry source. So if you, uh, not based on telemetry, but yeah, based on telemetry basically. Uh, as the parser goes through, it picks out which bolt says, all right, this is a bro message. This is, so I'm going to throw that into Elasticsearch. Or I'm going to do my enrichments and throw that in Elasticsearch. Or I might throw it into Hive if I want to. Um, the decision is based on just how you coded that bolt to do its next stages. And same thing with the, P the PCAP data. So we know it's a PCAP traffic coming off of this particular topic on Kafka. 
we know through its topology, the next stage after it's done all its internals is throw it into HBase. And the follow-up question, uh, how many events per second are you looking at in uh, Elasticsearch? More or less. <laughs> I don't know the numbers, I'm sorry. I don't know the entire numbers. Um, the, the actual size base, you know, I, w I would say operationally, um, no, I, can't, I can't give you a good number. Honestly, any number I give you is gonna be wrong, unfortunately. Okay, so as we mentioned before, all the enrichment process bolts happened. So once the Kafka reaches it, reaches the parser, it goes to Geo, goes to the Whois, goes to SIF, you know, for intelligence lookups, and then decides, do I go to Elasticsearch because it's something that's important to Elasticsearch or it's that I want analysts to see, or it's something I just want to log and maintain. I put all that in through HDFS through Hive. And so again, parser bolt. Message comes in, it says source IP, dest IP, domain. Geo enrichment, we do a cached collection, of course, because this happens way too often. We take the GeoLite data, any geo data you want, put it into MySQL database, quick query against it. Now we get all that geo code data. We now app append that onto the message. We do a who is enrichment, all this stuff goes back onto Kafka. Same data comes out through HBase. Do a thread intel, we look up on SIF. We, have, we take, actually export SIF's data into ours. So we're getting different, um, different sources of telemetry, or different sources of thread intel. Using SIF to help normalize it, exporting that SIF and putting it into HBase because we can't query SIF that fast. It just, it just can't hold up. So now after all these things are done, we have our enriched message, which then gets put into um, Kafka, which this one disappeared. So this. All these, these messages together get combined and then the uh, de destination bolt happens. It says, does it go to Elasticsearch, does it go to Hive, whatever. All right, so what did we have to do a little bit different to get Bro into this? Well, we could have used a flume to say, all right, read these files and throw it up. Um, but honestly, it, it's really slow when you're doing lots and lots of traffic. Uh, to have Flume do that. We wanted Flume to do other things that we couldn't easily modify. So we wrote a log Kafka edition, which will not be merged because the code is changing. Thank you. <laughs> but um, as soon as the new logging process is there, we'll redo it. So basically, it, it's, it's not fully baked out. It works. You know, I'm a hacker. I write code that once it works, I go, yay, and then it breaks. I go, oh. So, um, but my idea was let Bro do its deep packet functionality. You know, all the enrichment stuff is really awesome. Um, but again, when we're scaling at 10 gigabits a second, 50 gigabits a second, which is our, our ultimate goal, we're, we're going into you know, north-south data center points. We're going into entry exit points of high-speed service providers for this stuff. We're, see, we're being asked to do 50 gigabits a second to monitor. It's a lot of traffic to do and a lot of things to look at. But so let Bro do its thing, let its processing be the enrichment, or not the enrichment, but the, the, the extraction of the files, the extraction of the protocol data, all that stuff that takes its time. It, it, it eats a CPU up like crazy. But let it do that stuff and let OpenSOG, let the Hadoop cluster do all the enrichments for you. Let, let it do all those deciding factors so that you have this, you know, one screaming person, bro, screaming at you, and all you do is say, okay, yeah, keep screaming, because then I'll, I'll make a decision. How good is my data? How good is that data? Uh, or how, you know, what am I gonna do with it? And again, at the bottom one, tie your bro capture system to HDFS and extract files, and put that in your Hadoop cluster. Now you can do all this amazing stuff with math that you wanna do with all your PE files and your PDFs and all that kind of good stuff that you know, we do as a magic and source fire, but you can do it yourself too. Okay, so what is OpenSock not? Well, you probably have your opinions now, but to me, it's not easy to install, and it's not easy to get working quickly. Do you remember Bro 1.0? I do. <laughs> it was not easy, but it, but it was a good framework. There was the promise in that. You, you could see where it was going. To me, I see OpenSock. I see where it's going. I see what it wants to be, and I agree. 
It's going to get better, but right now it's tough. It's very rough around the edges. It's not going to be a killer of your existing scene. We're not doing all the cool things your scene can do. It's a lot of heavy lifting still to be done. We've only been working on, so we've been, Mesh Threat's been about a year in existence. OpenSock's probably about eight, six to eight months of, of actual development work. Um, so it's very rough around the edges. But it's getting better. At least it's not going to kill your scene, but not yet, you know. It's also not that silver bullet, which will solve all your security problems. I think we all know, we're all jaded security people. We're all, you know, we know there's no, no single thing that'll do it for us. But, you know, it's that rusty nail that you're about to step on with Java. Okay, so I've got maybe nine minutes here. Um, so this presentation was, was taken from uh, the data scientist who actually did it. So these slides, I cannot talk to, but I'll put them up here for you to consume, and we will get you the PDF, so, or get you the, the slides afterwards, so you can kind of understand them better. But what I do understand is that um, the machine learning is very complex. Uh, it is very intensive, uh, for especially the offline side. Uh, and the people that do it are amazing, and they speak a different language than I do. But that's cool. So for the off online models, again, all those bolts happen. The Hadoop cluster does its all its uh, amazing magic. And so they have a certain language of uh, clustering functionality. So these are the concepts that, that uh, James and Nate and all those guys are working, are working through right now and how they want to do it. Um, this reads kind of like Wikipedia. Yes, you will get the slides. Uh, this is all, like I said, this is all open, available. So, okay, yeah, by next week we'll have the slides, uh, or you can come to me and I can, if you trust my USB keys. <laughs> um, so really, I mean, I can go through these slides. You can see, read them. I'm not going to read them, honestly. It would be a waste of time. So, any questions? Any more questions? Yes. On your first few slides, you'd mentioned the term predictive modeling, and I was kind of curious what you meant by predictive. <laughs> what do I mean by predictive modeling? Um, <coughs> honestly, that's a, that's a uh, James and Nate question, honestly. Uh, but I think what they mean by that is you build a model, uh, and you think that model is awesome and, and awesome sauce, and you put it together, and it'll save the world. I think that's what they mean by it. Again, I'm not the... What kind of open source license are you looking into for publishing your work? Apache 2.0. Okay. Now that somebody else asked a question. <laughs> uh, a couple other questions. Um, your representation for V4 and V6 addresses, specifically your geolocation in Richmond, mm -hmm. are you guys dealing with that right now? I mean, I know SourceFire isn't yet. <laughs> oh, okay. So our... IP address to us is an IP address. We don't, well, let me, let me rephrase that. IP address is an IP address uh, unless they think it, it's a regex of some sorts to find out what it is. Um, we believe that uh, we're IP agnostic, V4, V6. And then our, the geodata on how good it is in V6, you're asking how good it is in V6 or? No, how are you combining them? How are we combining them? Um, I have to go back to you on that one. I don't know. Okay. Um, from, from raw alerts to analyst alerts, what's your typical time? Are we talking seconds? Are we talking minutes? Are we talking days? Depends on your workload. Um, we're, we're talking, we're wanting it to seconds. Um, so a raw alert gets processed. If the, the cluster has the, the compute resources for it, it'll be microseconds that it goes through all its bolts and get out and gets an alert. Uh, that should take very few Seconds. Let's see, I answered that. Um, uh, how are you dealing with the licensing, the potential change of licensing of MySQL? Um, that MySQL, is Oracle, Java, yeah. you know, same, same thing. 
Um, so the MySQL is there just because um, they decided to use that as a simple way. Uh, it can be Postgres. It could be SQLite. It could be whatever you want it to be. There's nothing in OpenSocket that says you have to use MySQL. Um, uh, inputs from Taxi and other IOC um, inputs? I didn't see anything that that is. Yeah, it's not in there right now, um, but it could be coded up. It's a matter of writing the right bolt enrichments. And I'll stop asking questions. No, you keep asking. That's fine. They're good. Good hard questions. All right, so in offline mode, um, Hadoop, MapReduce, which it, I, I've, everyone keeps saying that MapReduce is dead. Uh, I don't really see it dying yet. I see it being taken as a longer term strategy, but really streaming is where things are at. So, but you still want some offline models. You still want to do some Hadoop or do some MapReduce type activities. And so here's some of the um, offline algorithms that, that they're using or, or thinking of using, I should say. Okay. And I'm sure James is going to watch this and then I am me furiously. Don't say those things. All right, and um, streaming. So I've got maybe, yeah, like two slides left. How many slides do I have? Three slides. So if there are no other questions, I am really much done. <laughs> You'll see the slides here in a week or so.